Welcome to another video on the fossil record. My name is Benjamin Berger and I thought with this video I'd talk a little bit about scientific reprints. It's kind of a uh, uh, something that um, you don't hear very much about outside of uh, scientific disciplines, particularly paleontology uh, is involved with what a reprint is. Um, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about them in terms of how uh, paleontologists communicate uh, scientific discoveries to the public. And I'm down here um, going through a whole bunch of reprints that were gifted to the university and organizing them so they can be used uh, by students who are doing their research. So a reprint, really what it is, is a small uh, publication <laughs> that's put together um, of a article or scientific publication. It can be various sizes. This is a really nice slim one from uh, the American Naturalist. And um, in the old days, back uh, 20, 30 years ago um, and before, they would print out uh, a number of these copies and instead of these going into the journal that would be published, they would print some of these out on the paper that they, that they would use uh, to, to bind them together into the journal and send them to the author. So the author would get a stack of these, of their publications, and then a lot of times the scientist would then trade these, uh, these reprints with um, other scientists, or if a scientist wrote to them uh, interested in working on a project, they would say, hey, I published a paper on that, and they would send them a reprint. Now, oftentimes, if you went um, in you know, about 20 or 30 years ago, if you went to a scientific conference, oftentimes scientists would trade, and often, even today, they still trade reprints. Um, and, and this was a way you could expand your library without having to subscribe to a bunch of journals or be members of certain societies. So instead of subscribing to the American Naturalist, you could, and you were interested in this publication, you could contact the author and they might send you a reprint. So a lot of these reprints have been collected by various um, researchers who've uh, gifted these. And I've been going through and kind of organizing them that students can use them. Now, nowadays, most of the scientific communication that goes on is electronic. And that is that they are published online and you can easily get a PDF. You know, if you're interested in an article and you're having a tough time to find it electronically, contact the author. Um, and the author will oftentimes be excited that you're working on a project or interested in their research and they will send you a personal copy that they have. So that's the best way to get some of these uh, these today. Um, and so I, I keep most of my <laughs> reprints electronically in, uh, in files on my computer and I filled up a number of hard drives of scientific papers. But these are physical reprints and some of them are actually pretty, uh, pretty nicely printed. And so I want to go through and basically have it so that if you can't find an electronic version that, uh, that I can find it um, if someone requests it or um, uh, a student's working on a project, I can we can hopefully find it in this mess. But I thought I'd do something really interesting. I want to look at a couple of these reprints uh, and show them to you um, and kind of show you how uh, the way in which paleontologists have communicated uh, their fossil discoveries in the fossil record uh, has changed over time. So I thought I'd pull out some, uh, some reprints from different periods of time so we can kind of see how they are uh, how new discoveries, new fossils, were communicated to the public uh, throughout time. So I've pulled out some examples of different reprints from different time periods in the past, and I thought I'd show them to you and uh, show you how scientific publishing and the description of fossils has changed over time. Uh, some of the things that have remained the same and some of the things that have uh, really changed in the way we communicate new scientific discoveries, particularly discoveries of fossils. So uh, it's kind of fun to pull these out from, from different decades in the past. Um, this is the oldest one I could find. Um, this is from 1873. It's a original reprint by Edward Drinker Cope. Um, and, and what's really kind of fun about these older ones is you can see uh, where these reprints have been held and um, moved. So this one originally, I think it came from this library here. Uh, so as part of the U.S. Geological Survey, 
um, library, and then it went to Yale College in New Haven, um, and then it was it's been given this number, and then it was given this number, which is the current number um, that I use. And so you can sometimes look. This one's actually kind of a fun one. This is a, a paper by O. P. Hay, and it has the name of Barnum Brown on the top, a famous dinosaur paleontologist, Barnum Brown. Um, so this probably was owned by Barnum Brown at some point uh, in his collection. Um, so these really early publications, when you read them, they read a lot like letter, letters, uh, kind of like an email you might send <laughs> to, uh, to correspond back and forth with. Uh, this one is a great one. It's on some of Professor Marsh's criticisms. So this is in response to um, O.C. Marsh, who is Cope's rival. Uh, he published this. This is reprinted from the American Naturalist um, in 1873. So this is right at the height of their fighting back and forth. And these publications um, tend to have very little references to other articles. There's some actually beautiful reprints that Cope had done. So this is his Uintithere, um, Uintitherium specimen that he had collected up in the, in the Bridger Basin, Wyoming, uh, describing it. And when you read this, it reads like a letter. <laughs> it's like, I now turn to another subject, the raising of which was, uh, is due also to Professor Marsh. He has very commendably made himself acquainted with the literature, blah, 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 blah. So it's almost like you're writing a letter to someone or giving a talk and recording it. There's no abstract, there's no introduction. And occasionally you'll get some literature cited by the use of footnotes. This is one uh, from, from 1903, so about 30 years later. And uh, this is by O.P. Hay, the famous paleontologist O.P. Hay. And you can see at this point, um, a little, the format's a little bit more, more formal, but again, no literature cited. Um, if they cite people, they usually refer to people's names in the, uh, the literature, but they don't give a reference uh, to go find that in the library. So this is one I pulled out. This is from 1935. This is on a discovery of Mastodon. Um, it's published by the Cranbrook Institute of Science. I thought this one had some really good pictures to show you some of the uh, pictures. Now, you start getting photographs like this um, in some of those early publications as well, but the technology got much better. So you get plates, uh, which nowadays you don't have plates because we can, we can have images within the text um, that are added here. And what's kind of fun about this one, we can flip back and we can see that we start having literature cited here. So they're citing other papers for the first time. So this is one by uh, Ned Cobert. This one is actually maybe owned by R.L. Lowell, Richard Lowell at uh, Yale. And uh, probably that's where is a duplicate it's gotten rid of and given to a student. Um, and so this one's on a dinosaur from New Jersey that uh, Ned Cobert described. And here you can start seeing figures embedded in the text. Instead of plates, you start seeing some nice maps. They're well done. So you fairly decent illustrations. They still have plates. In fact, here's some plates here. Ah, some of the dinosaur bones from New Jersey. And uh, we start getting into a little bit longer lists of references. Not very many references cited. And here's the plate descriptions. So, so this is another one from the 60s. So we're moving up in time by uh, Bill Clemens um, from 1963. So we're seeing some lots of illustrations in there. We also see the first time abstract being used. So there's an abstract, an introduction, previous investigations. So there's headings. They tend to use a very standardized uh, systematic paleontology section here. This is in uh, the journal uh, Paleontology. And this is the one from the, these are two from the 80s, just to kind of show you the march of progress. Here we have an abstract. Both these have abstracts. These even have the keywords here that are used. And then we have introductions both. This is a Polish publication, uh, just to show you how very similar they were internationally. This is from the Carnegie Museum. And you can see that, you know, uh, 
if we flip to the end, we can see lots more literature citations uh, at this point. In fact, this is three pages long, so lots of literature citations. And this is a modern one just to show how they've changed. And this one is one I just printed out um, just to show you that we have a very formal way of doing everything now. We have an abstract introduction, the stratigraphy and age, the paleontology. Instead of having plates, the figures are embedded into the into the text our figure captions and when you flip it to the back there's usually very lengthy references and often an acknowledgement and it's written in a style uh, that's very very different from what we saw that cope was doing you know more than 200 years or 150 years ago almost uh, in 1873 right after the civil war so that's sort of the progress of of scientific descriptions and publications, but I thought I'd just show you some of these. They're kind of fun to pull out, take a look at.